Part Three of Volume Three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Pericles, Part Three. But Pericles was ever trying to restrain this extravagance of theirs, to lop off their expensive meddlesomeness, and to divert the greatest part of their forces to the guarding and securing of what they had already won. He considered it a great achievement to hold the Lacedaemonians in check, and set himself in opposition to these in every way, as he showed, above all other things, by what he did in the sacred war. The Lacedaemonians made an expedition to Delphi, while the Phocians had possession of the sanctuary there, and restored it to the Delphians. But no sooner had the Lacedaemonians departed than Pericles made a counter-expedition, and reinstated the Phocians. And whereas the Lacedaemonians had the Promantea, or right of consulting the oracle in behalf of others also, which the Delphians had bestowed upon them, carved upon the forehead of the bronze wolf in the sanctuary, he secured from the Phocians this high privilege for the Athenians, and had it chiseled along the right side of the same wolf. That he was right in seeking to confine the power of the Athenians within lesser Greece was amply proved by what came to pass. To begin with, the Euboans revolted, and he crossed over to the island with a hostile force. Then straightway word was brought to him that the Megarians had gone over to the enemy, and that an army of the enemy was on the confines of Attica, under the leadership of Pleus Doanax, the king of the Lacedaemonians. Accordingly, Pericles brought his forces back with all speed from Euboa for the war in Attica. He did not venture to join battle with hoplites, who were so many, so brave, and so eager for battle, but seeing that Pleus Doanax was a very young man, and that out of all his advisers he set most store by Cleandridas, whom the ephors had sent along with him, by reason of his youth, to be a guardian and an assistant to him, he secretly made trial of this man's integrity, speedily corrupted him with bribes, and persuaded him to lead the Peloponnesians back out of Attica. When the army had withdrawn and had been disbanded to their several cities, the Lacedaemonians, in indignation, laid a heavy fine upon their king, the full amount of which he was unable to pay, and so betook himself out of Lacedaemon, while Cleandridas, who had gone into voluntary exile, was condemned to death. He was the father of that Gylippus who overcame the Athenians in Sicily. And nature seems to have imparted covetousness to the son, as it were a congenital disease, owing to which he too, after noble achievements, was caught in base practices, and banished from Sparta in disgrace. This story, however, I have told at length in my life of Lysander. When Pericles, in rendering his accounts for this campaign, recorded an expenditure of ten talents for sundry needs. The people approved it without officious meddling, and without even investigating the mystery. But some writers, among whom is Theophrastus the philosopher, have stated that every year ten talents found their way to Sparta from Pericles, and that with these he conciliated all the officials there, and so staved off the war, not purchasing peace but time, in which he could make preparations at his leisure, and then carry on war all the better. However that may be, he again turned his attention to the rebels, and after crossing to Euboa, with fifty ships of war and five thousand hoplites, he subdued the cities there. Those of the Chalcidians who were styled Hippobote, or knights, and who were preeminent for wealth and reputation, he banished their city, and all the Histiaeans he removed from the country and settled Athenians in their places, treating them and them only, thus inexorably, because they had taken an Attic ship captive and slain its crew. After this, when peace had been made for thirty years between the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians, he got a decree passed for his expedition to Samos, alleging against its people that, though they were ordered to break off their war against the Miletians, they were not complying. Now since it is thought that he proceeded thus against the Samians, to gratify Aspasia, this may be a fitting place to raise the query what great art or power this woman had, that she managed as she pleased the foremost men of the state, and afforded the philosophers occasion to discuss her in exalted terms and at great length. That she was a Milesian by birth, daughter of one Axiochus, is generally agreed, and they say that it was in emulation of Thargelia, an Ionian woman of ancient times, that she made her onslaughts upon the most influential men. This Thargelia came to be a great beauty, 
and was endowed with grace of manners as well as clever wits. Inasmuch as she lived on terms of intimacy with numberless Greeks, and attached all her consorts to the king of Persia, she stealthily sowed the seeds of Persian sympathy in the cities of Greece by means of these lovers of hers, who were men of the greatest power and influence. And so Aspasia, as some say, was held in high favor by Pericles because of her rare political wisdom. Socrates sometimes came to see her with his disciples, and his intimate friends brought their wives to her to hear her discourse, although she presided over a business that was anything but honest or even reputable, since she kept a house of young courtesans. And Aeschines says that Lysiscles, the sheep-dealer, a man of low birth and nature, came to be the first man at Athens, by having with Aspasia after the death of Pericles. And in the Menexenus of Plato, even though the first part of it be written in a sportive vein, there is at any rate this much of fact, that the woman had the reputation of associating with many Athenians as a teacher of rhetoric. However, the affection which Pericles had for Aspasia seems to have been rather of an amatory sort, for his own wife was near of kin to him, and she had been wedded first to Hipponicus, to whom she bore Callias, surnamed the Rich. She bore also, as the wife of Pericles, Xanthippus and Parahis. Afterwards, since their married life was not agreeable, he legally bestowed her upon another man, with her own consent, and himself took Aspasia and loved her exceedingly. Twice a day, as they say, on going out and on coming in from the market-place, he would salute her with a loving kiss. But in the comedies she is styled now the new Omphela, new Dianera, and now Hera. Cratinus flatly called her a prostitute in these lines, as his Hera, Aspasia was born, the child of unnatural lust, a prostitute past shaming. And it appears also that he begat from her that bastard son, about whom Eupolis in his demis, represented him as inquiring with these words, And my bastard, doth he live? To which Maronides replies, Yea, and had long been a man, had he not feared the mischief of his harlot birth. So renowned and celebrated did Aspasia become, they say, that even Cyrus, the one who went to war with the great king for the sovereignty of the Persians, gave the name of Aspasia to that one of his concubines whom he loved best, who before was called Milto. She was a Phocaean by birth, daughter of one Hermotimus, and after Cyrus had fallen in battle, was carried captive to the king, and acquired the greatest influence with him. These things, coming to my recollection, as I write, it were perhaps unnatural to reject and pass them by. But to return to the war against the Samians, they accuse Pericles of getting the decree for this passed at the request of Aspasia, and in the special behalf of the Miletians, for the two cities were waging their war for the possession of Prian, and the Samians were getting the better of it, and when the Athenians ordered them to stop the contest and submit the case to arbitration at Athens, they would not obey. So Pericles set sail and broke up the oligarchical government which Samos had, and then took fifty of the foremost men of the state, with as many of their children as hostages, and sent them off to Lemnos. And yet they say that every one of these hostages offered him a talent on his own account, and that the opponents of democracy in the city offered him many talents besides. And still further, Pisouthmus, the Persian satrap, who had much good will towards the Samians, sent him ten thousand gold staters, and interceded for the city. However, Pericles took none of these bribes, but treated the Samians just as he had determined, set up a democracy, and sailed back to Athens. Then the Samians at once revolted, after Pisouthmus had stolen away their hostages from Lemnos for them, and in other ways equipped them for the war. Once more, therefore, Pericles set sail against them. They were not victims of sloth, nor yet of abject terror, but full of exceeding zeal in their determination to contest the supremacy of the sea. In a fierce sea-fight, which came off near an island called Tragia, Pericles won a brilliant victory, with four and forty ships outfighting seventy, twenty of which were infantry transports. Close on the heels of his victorious pursuit came his seizure of the harbor, and then he laid formal siege to the Samians, who somehow or other still had the daring to sally forth and fight with him before their walls. But soon a second and a larger armament came from Athens, and the Samians were completely beleaguered and shut in. Then Pericles took sixty triremes and sailed out into the main sea, as most authorities say, because he wished to meet a fleet of Phoenician ships, which was coming to the aid of the Samians, 
and fight it at as great a distance from Samos as possible. But according to Sesimbrotus, because he had designs on Cyprus, which seems incredible. But in any case, whichever design he cherished, he seems to have made a mistake. For no sooner had he sailed off than Melissus, the son of Ithagenes, a philosopher who was then acting as general at Samos, despising either the small number of ships that were left, or the inexperience of the generals in charge of them, persuaded his fellow citizens to make an attack upon the Athenians. In the battle that ensued the Samians were victorious, taking many of their enemy captive, and destroying many of their ships, so that they commanded the sea and laid in large store of such necessaries for the war as they did not have before. And Aristotle says that Pericles was himself also defeated by Melissus in the sea-fight which preceded this. The Samians retaliated upon the Athenians by branding their prisoners in the forehead with owls, for the Athenians had once branded some of them with the Samina. Now the Samina is a ship of war with a boar's head design for prow and ram, but more capacious than usual and paunch-like, so that it is a good deep sea traveller and a swift sailor too. It got this name because it made its first appearance in Samos, where Polycrates the tyrant had some built. To these brand marks, they say, the verse of Aristophanes made reeling reference, for, oh, how lettered is the folk of the Samians! Be that true or not, when Pericles learned of the disaster which had befallen his fleet, he came speedily to its aid. And though Melissus arrayed his forces against him, he conquered and routed the enemy and at once walled their city in, preferring to get the upper hand and capture it at the price of money and time, rather than of the wounds and deadly perils of his fellow-citizens. And since it was a hard task for him to restrain the Athenians in their impatience of delay and eagerness to fight, he separated his whole force into eight divisions, had them draw lots, and allowed the division which got the white bean to feast and take their ease, while the others did the fighting. And this is the reason, as they say, why those who have had a gay and festive time call it a white day from the white bean. Ephorus says that Pericles actually employed siege engines, in his admiration of their novelty, and that Artemon the engineer was with him there, who since he was lame, and so had to be brought on a stretcher to the works which demanded his instant attention, was dumbed periphoritus. Heracleides, Ponticus, however, refutes this story out of the poems of Anacreon, in which Artemon Periphoritus is mentioned many generations before the Samian War and its events. And he says that Artemon was very luxurious in his life, as well as weak and panic-stricken in the presence of his fears, and therefore for the most part sat still at home, while two servants held a bronze shield over his head to keep anything from falling down upon it. Whenever he was forced to go abroad, he had himself carried in a little hammock, which was borne along just above the surface of the ground. On this account he was called Periphoritus. After eight months the Samians surrendered, and Pericles tore down their walls, took away their ships of war, and laid a heavy fine upon them, part of which they paid at once, and part they agreed to pay at a fixed time, giving hostages therefore. To these details Durus the Samian adds stuff for tragedy, accusing the Athenians and Pericles of great brutality, which is recorded neither by Thucydides, nor Ephorus, nor Aristotle but he appears not to speak the truth when he says, forsooth, that Pericles had the Samian triarchs and marines brought into the market-place of Miletus and crucified there, and that then, when they had already suffered grievously for ten days, he gave orders to break their heads in with clubs and make an end of them, and then east their bodies forth without burial rites. At all events, since it is not the want of Durus, even in cases where he has no private and personal interest, to hold his narrative down to the fundamental truth, it is all the more likely that here, in this instance, he has given a dreadful portrayal of the calamities of his country, that he might calumniate the Athenians. When Pericles, after his subjection of Samos, had returned to Athens, he gave honourable burial to those who had fallen in the war, and for the oration which he made, according to the custom, over their tombs, he won the greatest admiration. But as he came down from the Bema, while the rest of the women clasped his hand and fastened wreaths and fillets on his head, as though he were some victorious athlete, Elpinisi drew nigh and said, This is admiral in thee, Pericles, and deserving of wreaths, in that thou hast lost us many brave citizens, not in a war with Phoenicians or Medes, like my brother Simon, but in the subversion of an allied and kindred city. On Elpinisi's saying this, Pericles, with a quiet smile, it is said, quoted to her the verse of Archilochus, 
thou hast not else, in spite of years, perfumed thyself. Ion says that he had the most astonishingly great thoughts of himself for having subjected the Samnians, whereas Agamemnon was all of ten years in taking the barbarian city, he had in nine months' time reduced the foremost and most powerful people of Ionia. And, indeed, his estimate of himself was not unjust, nay, the war actually brought with it much uncertainty and great peril, if, indeed, as Thucydides says, the city of Samos came within a very little of stripping from Athens her power on the sea. After this, when the billows of the Peloponnesian War were already rising and swelling, he persuaded the people to send aid and succor to the Corsiraeans in their war with the Corinthians, and so to attach to themselves an island with a vigorous naval power, at a time when the Peloponnesians were as good as actually at war with them. But when the people had voted to send the aid and succor, he dispatched Lacedaemonius, the son of Simon, with only ten ships, as it were, in mockery of him. Now there was much good will and friendship on the part of the house of Simon towards the Lacedaemonians. In order, therefore, that in case no great or conspicuous achievement should be performed under the generalship of Lacedaemonius, he might so be all the more calumniated for his laconism, or sympathy with Sparta, Pericles gave him only a few ships, and sent him forth against his will. And in general he was prone to thwart and check the sons of Simon, on the plea that not even in their names were they genuinely native, but rather aliens and strangers, since one of them bore the name of Lacedaemonius, another that of Thessalus, and a third that of Elias. And they were all held to be the sons of a woman of Arcadia. Accordingly, being harshly criticized because of these paltry ten ships, on the ground that he had furnished scanty aid and succor to the needy friends of Athens, but a great pretext for war to her accusing enemies, he afterwards sent out other ships, and more of them, to Corsera, the ones which got there after the battle. The Corinthians were incensed at this procedure, and denounced the Athenians at Sparta, and were joined by the Megarians, who brought their complaint that from every market-place and from all the harbours over which the Athenians had control, they were excluded and driven away, contrary to the common law and the formal oaths of the Greeks. The Agenitans also, deeming themselves wronged and outraged, kept up a secret wailing in the ears of the Lacedaemonians, since they had not the courage to accuse the Athenians openly. At this juncture Potidaea too, a city that was subject to Athens, although a colony of Corinth, revolted, and the siege laid to her hastened on the war all the more. Notwithstanding all, since embassies were repeatedly sent to Athens, and since Archidamus, the king of the Lacedaemonians, tried to bring to a peaceful settlement most of the accusations of his allies, and to soften their anger, it does not seem probable that the war would have come upon the Athenians for any remaining reasons, if only they could have been persuaded to rescind their decree against the Megarians and be reconciled with them. And therefore, since it was Pericles who was mostly of all opposed to this, and who incited the people to abide by their contention with the Megarians, he alone was held responsible for the war. They say that when an embassy had come from Lacedaemon to Athens to treat of these matters, and Pericles was shielding himself behind the plea that a certain law prevented his taking down the tablet on which the decree was inscribed, Polyases, one of the ambassadors, cried, Well, then, don't take it down, but turn the tablet to the wall. Surely there's no law preventing that. Clever as the proposal was, however, not one whit the more did Pericles give in. He must have secretly cherished, then, as it seems, some private grudge against the Megarians, but by way of public and open charge he accused them of appropriating to their own profane uses the sacred territory of Eleusis, and proposed a decree that a herald be sent to them, the same also to go to the Lacedaemonians with the denunciation of the Megarians. This decree, at any rate, is the work of Pericles, and aims at a reasonable and humane justification of his course. But after the herald who was sent, Anthemocritus, had been put to death through the agency of the Megarians, as it was believed, Chirinus proposed a decree against them, to the effect that there be irreconcilable and implacable enmity on the part of Athens towards them, and that whosoever of the Megarians should set foot on the soil of Attica be punished with death, and that the generals, whenever they should take their ancestral oath of office, add to their oath this clause, that they would invade the Megarid twice during each succeeding year, and that Anthemocritus be buried honorably at the Thracian gates, which are now called the Dipylum. But the Megarians denied the murder of Anthemocritus, and threw the blame for Athenian hate on Aspasia and Pericles, appealing to those far-famed and hackneyed Versicles 
of the Acarnians. Semetha, harlot, one of Megara's womankind, was stolen by gilded youths more drunk than otherwise, and so the Megarians, pangs of wrath all reeking hot, paid back the theft and raped of Aspasia's harlots, too. End of Pericles, Part 3